Welcome to Season 5 of Purposeful Empathy, a show dedicated to amplifying the voices of people from around the globe who understand that the world needs more empathy and are doing something about it. Today's episode was brought to you by Grand Huron International, an on-demand coaching provider for individuals and companies. Thanks for watching the show. Enjoy. So welcome to a new episode of Purposeful Empathy. Today I'm joined by the fabulous Naomi Toland, who is the head teacher at Honey Bees Preschool in Auckland, New Zealand. She just actually showed me the beautiful blue skies of Auckland, New Zealand as the sun is setting here in Montreal. She's also a Google innovator and the creator of Empathetic Educators. Naomi has experience working across the primary sector with kids two to three years old. She's taught in London and Tokyo and now in Auckland. Empathetic Educators is a global community inquiring into all things nerdy, N-E-R-D-Y. Join Naomi and educators around the world as they explore topics including neuroscience, empathy, relationships, design thinking, psychology, and much more. So welcome, Naomi, to the show. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for that amazing introduction. And just, yeah, yeah, the invite to be actually with you in this space. So, yeah, thank you. (laughs) Yeah, and it's great because you've invited me to be on your show, but I got to do the interview first. Look at how that happened. So why don't you start by telling us, you know, the dream and the vision and the goals of empathetics, um, empathetic educators? Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much again for like the, yeah, the chance to be on your show because I think empathy is just I love it like we've connected over that and like the superhero like the superpower of the future um so it all kind of started um my name is Neomish Holland and I'm from Ireland originally but I uh, moved to England um to start my first year teaching 10 yeah 10 years ago I started my course and it all kind of started from there in my first year teaching I kind of really seen a decline in my own mental health and kind of my own capacity to I kind of get through life. Life being as an adult is very different to get into the adult world. <laughs> and so I kind of found myself struggling because I didn't have the tools to deal with what I was going through. But also I was in um, an inner city London school. So I had a lot of learners going through different things and th- things I'd never experienced in my life. And it made me realize how how we need to support learners, not just academically, but also in the in the social space as well. And so I was seeing myself decline and I, I started asking myself, why? I started asking myself, why am I, why am I responding in this way? Why is my body and my brain just not been able to cope with life? And it made me realize that there was things I could do to make that not happen. And I think that's whenever the change happened. I was like, whenever I started learning about neuroscience or learning about my brain, I was like, this needs to be known more. Like the more I was understanding my brain, the more I was understanding the learner's brains and seeing them for who they are, not what I was expecting them to be. And um, and so that empathy piece really shone through. So yeah, that's kind of where, where it all started and <laughs> where it all came from. What do you hope to accomplish with empathetic educators? Yeah, I think for me, like empathy, empathy is a part where we're like understanding people in front of us. Like that, that's a big part of um what I what I want to achieve is the understanding piece. And another thing that I've noticed you talk about is like that be the change. And so I the, the, the tagline of empathetic educators is our choices have an impact. What impact are you going to have? And I think that's what started making me realize the more that I was being more intentional with my own choices for my own brain and more intentional for understanding myself and understanding the learners in front of me the more I could be intentional with the choices that I was making and I think that's what I hope with empathetic educators like you referenced the nerdy side of things the neuroscience the empathy the relationships the design thinking and the psychology I think the more that we can share what's going on with our brain understand why it's happening the more that we can help the learners be more intentional, the more we can have, help our team be more intentional with our actions and the choices that we have. So that's kind of what I'm about. I'm, I'm not a neuroscience expert. I'm really interested in researching it and sharing that research in the, in the space too. So, yeah. Because so much of it happens at the formative years, right? And teachers mm-hmm. do so much heavy lifting in terms of helping young people see the world and navigate the world. And with all the social emotional learning, SEL, um, pedagogy, you know, for places and jurisdictions that have adopted that, there's just so much value in this world, in a highly mediated world where all of these kids are being exposed to sort of toxic social media, 
um, mm. that, you know, this couldn't be more important. So I really, really appreciate what you're doing and, and the resources you're putting out and what you're sharing to the educator community. So you believe that our mindset has an am- impact on our ability to empathize with ourselves mm. and others. How does that happen? So how does our mindset really matter? So I think going back to my first year of teaching, I talked about like not having the tools to actually go forward in in what I was dealing with. And I think I noticed, um, I actually had an MMA fight, um, an MMA fight uh, two years ago. And I think that really enlightened me towards what mindset is. So I was working with all these people who were MMA fighters and, and they were, they were getting their mindset ready. And I think it really, that accountability piece and that challenge piece. So whenever I was my first year teaching, I was expecting myself to be perfect. I was expecting myself to be this amazing teacher that would like, that I've never, I was never going to get there because I hadn't learned the steps to actually get there. And so I think as teachers and just as human beings, being understanding and being empathetic to yourself and saying my mindset is going to help me get forward my mindset I'm not there yet I'm not there I'm not there but I can get there through steps to get there and I think that's whenever it started to shift with me in my first year so I was getting migraines weekly and I'd never got migraines before in my first year of teaching I think that's whenever I realized something's going on with my brain so I need to fix it and so whenever I was getting tools like understanding what was going on for me taking a breath doing the breathing and then holding myself accountable for keeping working on that that's whenever I started to see myself change and be more productive and be more understanding. And whenever I was getting myself in a rut, I was able to say, no, let's take a step back. Let's understand ourselves. Let's understand the, the, the situation you're in. And then I was able to go forward from where I was, not where I was expecting to be. But that acceptance piece is such a big part of your mindset, because if you're constantly in the expectation space, then you're never going to be accepting of where you truly are to then move forward from there. So yeah, that's what empathy piece is for me. Right. And so the mindset that you're speaking about, uh, this is how it's landing for me. Mm. This is how it's landing for me is that first of all, to have some degree of self-compassion for where you mm. are and that you can't be perfect, but then also to have the mindset of like where you do want to be so that mm-hmm. you are in a growth mindset right where you feel like you can't you do have the skills and competencies to get you there but you're going to forgive yourself that you don't have them yet now so Mm -hmm. kind of work in progress but always leaning into what you want to be I really like that I think that's what that's really important because I think that's what I noticed about myself whenever we can be whenever you're trying to be kind to yourself sometimes you can just take it all away and kind of like take everything away and just not even look towards your goals because you're too overwhelmed by your expectations but I think having an acceptance helps you then put the steps in place to then get to where you want to be. Cause you don't want, we don't want our learners not having goals. We don't want our learners not having achievements or our team not having that, but it's about being empathetic to then move forward. Like you talk about that action piece. It's like that, that cognitive empathy, understand the feelings, understand what they're going through. Then that action piece is just, is just so important as well. Cause then that helps you move forward with where you're actually at. So, yeah. So I'm going to take two seconds, actually, to just kind of deviate from some questions that I wanted to ask you to Mm. kind of talk about the teaching profession for a bit, because, Mm. you know, everybody who has any bit of education has met with teachers, right? So like Mm. they've gone through public education or whatever education, but they've gone through primary and likely secondary and maybe even post-secondary. And so everybody has experiences with teachers and kind of Mm -hmm. knows what teaching is about on a theoretical and then a lived experience perspective, but maybe not everybody, you know, steps into the shoes of a teacher on a regular basis Mm -hmm. to imagine what it's like to be teaching right now. So I wonder Mm -hmm. if you would share an anecdote or an experience or a challenge of what it means to be a teacher for you and some of the things that actually really cause you to come home and say wow that wasn't an easy day or wow Mm. I could have done that differently and I'm happy to do the same because I I have something very (laughs) recent that I could share I think it's like well I think I'm pretty sure most teachers who are listening to this or no I'm I'm pretty sure it's every day There's, there's a day you come back and you're like that wasn't that that was a pretty pretty crazy day but 
well an anecdote is that I've just moved back from Japan like you said to New Zealand and I had two days of working in my new job and then lockdown happened in New Zealand and so I had not even two days a day and a half then we got the announcement and so when you said talk about when I when I picture teaching as a profession I just think teaching is like thinking on your feet that's like you're constantly just on you don't know what's going to happen to the kids in front of you you don't know what's going to happen to the teachers in front of you and I think that's where empathy for me is important because you can proactively plan things because I was constantly in like a reactive mode whenever I was in my first year of teaching. I was reacting to every single thing that was happening. And I would have a kid come in and something bad happened to them from their family. And then I would have to emotionally wear what they were going through. And I think that's when you're asking like the anecdote of teachers. We we do feel the feels of all of our kids. And I think that can be the draining part of a teacher. But I kind of talk about the empathy but not at the expense of ourselves so that's where I talk about the intentionality piece is the more that we are empathizing with our learners I was wearing every single thing like my partner I'm surprised he stayed because I was literally crying every week being like this happened to this kid and this happened to this kid and how can the world make those things happen to like these five-year-old six-year-old kids and so I think for me I empathy not at the expense of ourselves is that we are understanding our learners but we're not wearing every single thing because as teachers that's where I think is the the challenge that we face. We just constantly, our community is going through all different things and we want to be the support system. But if we are not strong in what we are with, then that's whenever it can all crumble. So yeah, yeah, that's what I think. <laughs> and thinking on your feet means a lot because you never know where mm. a conversation is going to go. You never nope. know what's going to trigger somebody in the class. You have to hold space for it. Then you have mm-hmm. to navigate all the complexities of, you know, a classroom that is, you know, all of a sudden going someplace with an idea and being able to facilitate it and find some, some way of, you know, bringing peace to a space. Mm. Like just for example, yesterday, you know, two nights ago, I took a, a few minutes to pay tribute to a girl that sadly was stabbed to death close to McGill mm. campus and uh, by her boyfriend and a lot of students from McGill walked past the incident or heard of the incident from somebody who see, who saw it and it was traumatizing mm-hmm. and um i my value system is that okay we definitely have a, a syllabus and curriculum and you know i care about the learning obviously but sometimes there's just you know we can call them a teachable moment or just a moment for humanity to sort of surface mm-hmm. that takes precedence and that just providing a bit of space to have a conversation about that, even if it's heavy and even if it's tough, yeah. is is something worthwhile doing? Because otherwise, we're, what are we? We're just like robots going through life, going to like, you know, not taking time to integrate. Mm-hmm. And so we would spent some time talking about that. And, you know, in- inevitably, we at some point had to shift gears onto the rest of the class. But I got home and I was just absolutely like I I had been hit by a Mack truck. Like I just Mm. couldn't process whether or not it was the right thing that I did. You know, did I handle that properly? Even though I felt Mm -hmm. like what surfaced was helpful and that doing it was right. And uh, my husband was trying to like, also, you know, Mm. say, don't worry, you know, you trust your intuition, trust your instincts, Mm -hmm. you know what you're doing in the classroom. People know you do it from a place of caring. And it wasn't until the next morning, I had a terrible sleep. And it wasn't until mm. the next morning where a student, thank goodness for, you know, once in a while, a student taking the time to reach out to you. And I know it doesn't happen with five-year-olds necessarily, but she actually wrote and she said, that was tough. That was really tough. Um, and I cried on the way home thinking mm. about femicide. And she says, but isn't that the point of education for us to be reflecting on things, you know? Mm. And so How powerful is that? That's so powerful that the, 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 the child is reaching out for that conversation too. That's so lovely. That's so good. And isn't that why we need empathy in mm. classrooms? Because these <laughs> students are complex human beings and they're living in a really complex life, like with, you know, eco-anxiety and, you know, when they hear about George, Flo- George Floyd's murder and, you know, systemic racism, they, you know, the generation coming up the rank just has such a different value system in terms of equity, diversity, like they take it for granted, they want justice in the world, and they want to live in a sustainable planet, you know, the drill. So you've just got, you know, a whole host of burdens on the next generation. And I just want them to flourish. I just want them to be happy. 
And I think that's what I, that's what gives me hope. Like that's what like that's the part like where there is so many burdens and there is so many things we have to go through. I think that's why empathy for me is the superpower because the more we can understand like because sometimes you'd be like why is this happening why is this happening and what's going on and why am I actually doing what I'm doing like that first year I, I I've always wanted to be a teacher like my whole life I was five-year-old like doing all the teddies teaching my I was an oldest sibling so I was teaching all my my brothers and sister brothers like whether they wanted it or not I was teaching them <laughs> and, and like and then my first year teaching I was going to walk out I was contemplating not being a teacher like and that's like you said but it gives me hope because then you have those moments that you can connect and you can realize that what is the curriculum? The curriculum is meant to be that we are supporting learners for their now and their future. So if we can create a curriculum based on empathy, based in not just I'm doing the same lesson over and over and over every single year, because that's what the curriculum says. It's reimagining the curriculum to have more empathy for the kids exactly for their now and their future. And I think that's what there was. A, there's a leader that really, really impacted me is what do you want to, what does your kid want to look like at 18? What do you want your kid to look like at 18? What does your kid want to be at 18? And how do we start now to then look forward to their future? So it is about their now. And I think sometimes as educators or as the system, it's constantly working in the future, not in the present. And I think if we can try and work in the present with the learners that are actually there in front of us, not what we're trying to get at the end of the year where we have to get them, have to get them there. It's who are they? What do they want? What do they, what do they, what do they bring into the table? And working from there and I think that's where the hope part for me because there is like like you just said like that it's I've had so many days like that where you're just walking home and you're like did I deal with that right did I did I understand that right and I think the tools aren't there for teachers so if we can put give more tools to the teachers to understand give them more empathy for themselves then that then hopefully we're not coming home so Mis- misguided and did I make the right choice did I not make the right choice did I go the right way did I not go the right way you can say oh I know I did because I had these tools in my my toolkit to move forward in that conversation so yeah mm. yeah 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 all right you're speaking to the converted <laughs> so with you on this so I know the phrase walking in their shoes means something special to you mm. and why why is that I was um talking to Barbara Bray um who's a great great educator and she was saying that she was talking to someone about how we have to take our shoes off first before we walk in their footsteps because our shoes come with all the different baggage and all of our our perspectives and a big part of empathetic educators is looking at our perspectives so we're looking at like what how we see the world and and contemplating what can we do differently to understand the people in front of us so I really like that idea of taking your shoes off first to then walk in the person's footsteps. But I think we have to understand our shoes in the first place. So we have to look at our shoes and say, why am I wearing them? Like, why, why, am, I, why am I thinking these thoughts? What, what's caused me to think that way? And I think going back to that growth piece is I think I've grown so much because I can take my shoes off and then change them sometimes. Like they don't have to be the one shoes that you wear all the time. And I really like that analogy of walking in in someone's footsteps, but taking our shoes off first and understanding our shoes. So we we have to wear like clown shoes sometimes because we have to have a funny moment. We have to understand things with our learners, but sometimes we have to like understand the perspective of what that is. So yeah, that's kind of why I like that phrase. Mm. You know, it kind of reminds me of this um, analogy that I've talked about on on a couple of podcasts, but worth mentioning here again, is um, Elif Gokidem, who lives in Washington, D.C., who's originally from Turkey, shared this with me. She has a Ph.D. in Islamic art, and I asked her Mm -hmm. if she learned anything, because she right now talks about museums being um, public institutions that can um, grow empathy in our culture mm. uh, if, if they're leveraged well. And so I asked her, I said, is there anything about what you studied in Islamic art that put you on to empathy or that informed you about empathy? And she said, oh, absolutely, the circle. I was like, mm. really? Anyways, I'm gonna, I, I won't do all the, the, the usual lead up. I'll just say, when you think about a circle, okay? Mm. A circle is made up of an infinite number of points along its circumference. Mm. You could add a little point and it'll grow just a little bit bigger. You could add 10 more points, it'll grow a little bit bigger, right? And she said, if if you think about all of those points as individuals on the planet, right? We're all, you know, 7 billion of us. Mm. We're all equidistant to the center. So we're of equal value. We deserve dignity and respect. So we're like 
you know, if you want to call the center God or you want to call it mm. whatever brought life to the planet, we're equally equidistant regardless of mm. our situation. But we are all, we see the center from a different perspective. Even mm. if we're side by side, there's a slight difference of perspective. If we're on a different part of the circle, we're in a different perspective. And so I find that a super valuable metaphor because we have totally lived different lived experience and yet we are still all human. So I think mm. that's the thing about empathy is that we share this thing called a common humanity, but we can't really know what someone else has been through or is going through because they are having a different lived experience. So it's the same kind of idea, I mm. think, as you take off your shoes, recognize what shoes you're wearing and, mm. you know, try to think about it from someone else's perspective. I, I love that analogy though. I love like that, like, because that, that shows it's almost like the, the footsteps and the circle go hand in hand like it's like you can almost like see like people taking off shoes to go into the next shoes like beside in that circle those that's a beautiful like connection between the two because it is that's that's one of like at empathetic educators I talk about six different things and perspective is one of them um but the other ones are growth relationships accountability challenge systems and perspectives and I think we go deep into all those different things but perspective for me is probably one of the one of the key parts because that's how you understand the person in front of you I think for whenever I was in my first year going back to that idea of teaching again whenever I was trying to get this curriculum done but then we were told to try and know thy learner but it was it was that we were doing the same the same in English you kind of do the same thing like we were doing in year two you always do the great fire of London and that was kind of like to me I kind of thought but what are these learners getting out and the learners the year before didn't and it's it's how can we weave the conversation to be that you're meeting the kids meeting their perspectives meeting them where they're at and understanding them and, it, and again it goes back to that humanity piece it's it's I believe empathetic educators it is to do with education at the minute, but I want it to be on a bigger scale where it's actually empathetic educators. We are all educators in the world. We are all learners in the world. We are all understanding this world together. And that's where the perspective piece comes in. So, mm. What I want to do is I'm going to put in the episode description a uh, link to empathetic educators. It's full of resources, videos, um, where you're interviewing other people and learning about how empathy can be deployed in classrooms. Thank you so much for your work. The last question I want to ask before we say goodbye, and I love asking the delicious question to my guests, is can you think of a time, Naomi, when you were at the receiving end of empathy and what that meant for you? I think the, the understanding piece, like that's that's the biggest part is like empathy for me. So um, it was back in my first year of teaching. And like I said, it was like a tough, tough year. And it was my co-partner, um, my co-teacher, and I was going through all this stuff. Like I was getting my migraines. I was thinking that I'm going to leave teaching. I'm going to not come back. And I'm like, it's all, it's all done. And it was just, that, it was a sitting with me fact of it. The, per the person was sitting with me. They weren't, in, they weren't probably even intentionally trying to be empathetic, but it was just that like, Lorna sitting with me and just being understanding. She wasn't trying to change my perspective. She wasn't trying to make me happier or she wasn't trying to go with anything else it was just her understanding that it is tough and what you're doing right now look at all the things you're trying to do um but it is tough what you're going through you are you're having learners left right and center go through tough things and that's okay that's the way life is that's what you're going through that's and it was that acceptance piece even though I wasn't accepting it just having that person beside me just to go through it. I think something like you say, sometimes listening is the most important part. Sometimes we can try and fix things. I was such a fixer in my first year of teaching. I was trying to fix everyone, trying to fix everyone I was around. But the more I let go of that fixing analogy, the more I was actually able to accept the person in front of me. And that's what that's what Lorna was doing for me at that time. She wasn't trying to fix my problems. She was just saying, yeah, I'm sitting here with you. We're understanding it together and it's going to be okay and that made me feel it's going to be okay because I had someone there to talk to and talking is such a big part of letting that person express themselves letting that person just feel their feels and just understand it and then afterwards we then talked about what I could do like so then it was like being the moment being present being understanding then we did have a chat about okay so what are we going to do tomorrow to make it a little bit better than today and that's like that's like you're moving forward with the action but you have completely been in the moment in that in that in that part so i think that that's where yeah that really stuck out to me as one of my big moments
There are some really gifted listeners that know how to hold mm. the space. It sounds like mm. Lorna was that for you. <laughs> Well, yeah. she'll get the chance to hear you give her a shout out when this video goes <laughs> up. Thank you so much for spending your morning uh, mm -hmm. with me on a Friday. I guess it's your Friday morning, right? It is. Happy weekend yeah. to me. <laughs> <laughs> happy, happy weekend. Thank you so much. And I want to thank all our listeners and viewers. Mm -hmm. See you next week at Purposeful Empathy. Thank you. Bye. <laughs> What if you had access to your own council of coaches to help you break free from your thinking clutter, or make an important decision, or liberate you from whatever's holding you back? At Grant Huron International, you get to choose the coach of your choice from any place, any time. Visit GrantHuronInternational.com and harness the power on-demand coaching today.